Mongolia, a land of grasslands and endless sky. A rugged people whose ancestors once conquered the world. Against its illustrious past, Mongolia nowadays struggles with a much more basic and urgent priority, rescuing its economy. Some leaders believe the future lies by connecting to China's belt and road. Mongolia is a landlocked country, so this would give an opportunity to expand our connectivity uh, to, to building and improving and developing infrastructure. Others maintain a deep distrust of China. Anti-Chinese sentiment is still runs strong. Sandwiched between Russia and China, Mongolia will now be the connector on a major Belt and Road economic corridor. Amidst debate over the role of China in mining, environment, and finance, what is the way forward for Mongolia? A Belt and Road initiative linking China and Russia has sparked celebration and concern. Rival powers, Russia and China, Russia and with China. Russia or China? In my journey along the road to Russia, I'll visit China's border cities with Russia. This entire city is lit in gold. I'll discover the splendors of Mongolia with its untapped riches. It's like a house on wheels. Yeah. Mysterious Uzbekistan through its stunning cities. And I'll explore the Kremlin and the power it wields. This is my journey through one of China's key economic corridors on its Belt and Road. Genghis Khan may have been dead for 800 years, but his legacy is very much alive in modern Mongolia. Popular music, like this hit song from Mongolian band The Who, references the Great Mongol Empire. And in the nation's capital city, the Khan's honor looms large. The Great Khan sent his armies across deserts and mountains in the 13th century. The empire covered almost all of Asia and even some of Europe, controlling far-off territories in what is now Beijing, Myanmar, Kazakhstan, and Iran. To say that Mongolians are proud of Genghis Khan and the warrior heritage is an understatement. They're quick to remind everybody that the Great Wall of China was built to protect the Chinese from a Mongol invasion. That and also the fact that the Mongols' rule over all of China lasted for over 100 years. That was in the 11th century, during the Yuan Dynasty. The ancient Silk Road is famous for transporting treasures traded between the East and West. It flourished during Mongol rule. But when the empire declined, the Silk Road quickly became dust. Today, with the revival of the Silk Road, Mongolia-China relations are now entering a new chapter. But history will always color perceptions and here's a quick overview of modern-day events to understand Mongolian-China relations. There is Mongolia, a sovereign nation, and Inner Mongolia, which is located in China. Here's a simplified history of how two Mongolias came to be. China ruled Mongolia for more than 200 years until 1911. 
On that year, Mongolians declared independence from its Chinese Qing dynasty overlords. The move was backed by the Soviet Union. China didn't agree, and soon it was all-out war. In 1921, the Soviets drove the Chinese out of Outer Mongolia, and Mongolia became a Soviet satellite state. The Soviet Union reinforced Mongolia's defenses and also supported it economically with a subsidy estimated at 37% of the country's GDP. The Soviet collapse in 1991 brought democracy to Mongolia, breaking the country free of Soviet control and resulting in the full withdrawal of Russian troops by 1992. But that independence came alongside the collapse of the Moscow-led economic system. Since then, Mongolia has been increasingly dependent on China. Today, about 90% of Mongolian exports go to China, and over 40% of Mongolian imports come from China. The two countries continue to share a border of over 4,700 kilometers. For a landlocked country that borders two great powers, China and Russia, geopolitics is a fact of life, and there are deep implications to Mongolia's economy. In recent times, there's been a global discussion about China's Belt and Road Initiative and debt trap diplomacy. Analysts all over the world have pointed out that Mongolia is one of eight countries to be at risk of this debt trap. But why has Mongolia borrowed so much from China, and what has it spent it on? What does the term debt trap mean for ordinary Mongolians and their daily lives? I've been told there's one place I can go to find some answers. This is Mongolia's slum district in the capital, Ulaanbaatar. There's no access to water and spotty access to electricity. What sets it apart from the other major slums in the world are these gurs, or tents. These gurs are the traditional houses of the nomadic Mongolians. Only now, instead of seeing these in the great open grasslands, you find them here, housing the nation's internally displaced rural folk. They make up half of the capital city's population. That's about 800,000 people. The Gur district has become the most pressing social crisis of Mongolia. Semvanota. Hi, I'm Anthony. Nice to meet you. Ah, thank you. So, how many of you live here? Ah, mana girul toto dan terdak. Ah, I see. Hello. Lorsol Marush used to be a herder, living in the Great Mongolian Steppes. But Lorsol's life, like many others here, has been hard hit by climate change. He and his family moved here after a weather phenomenon known as the Zud. The Zud is an extreme winter condition, with temperatures dropping to 50 below zero and thick snow covering the grasslands. Tasson <laughs> The Zud phenomenon has killed more than 20 million animals since the start of the 2000s. It isn't just lethal to the animals, it is killing off an entire way of life. With his animals dead, Lorsol can no longer live in the steppes, and so he took a leap of faith and moved his family here to the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. Lorsol and practically all of his neighbors are hapless victims of climate change. Thousands of former herders arrive every year, requiring electricity 
heating, medical services, education, and most importantly, jobs. And all of that costs money. In part, to deal with the challenges of the Gur district, Mongolia has had to borrow huge sums from China for housing projects, roads, electricity plants, wastewater treatment plants. And quite a number of these projects have fallen under the Belt and Road Initiative. Lorsol Marush and his family have personally felt the impact of these projects. He now works as a cement truck driver for a construction company and has made enough money to buy his kids smartphones. Yeah, I think you're getting there. You definitely should spend more time playing this than uh, playing on your phone, huh, bud? <laughs> <laughs> the infrastructure spending that employs people like Lorsol has cost Mongolia billions. And the government of Mongolia has come under fire for falling prey to China's so-called debt trap. Lagwa Erdin is a Pulitzer Prize winner and a renowned journalist in Mongolia. He has covered stories on Mongolia's foreign policy for a decade. Now, obviously, the government has had to borrow money from China to build roads and grow the economy. But is there also a concern that Mongolia might be facing a debt trap? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Mongolian uh, debt to um, income ratio and it at our state budget level has exceeded the um, uh, budget law for years now. There are concerning reports of China using Belt and Road Initiative to aggressively use their um, uh, policy. Um, and there's track records of that. There's uh, media reports by Quartz and Belt and Road Research uh, Centers, different think tanks, mostly from the Western part of the world. There are opposing views in Mongolia. I think it's a very divided issue. So there's no clear view on whether it's a debt trap or not? Depends on if you see it as a debt or because the Mongolian word loan actually translates into a debt. So uh, taking a loan out of a bank, uh, financing your house, getting a loan for your kids to go to college, well, all be translates into burden in Mongolia. As debates raged around how to deal with Mongolia's heavy borrowing from China, crisis hit the economy. Mongolia. Only recently, this was the darling of emerging markets. Mongolia once made headlines as the world's fastest growing economy, expanding at 17%. That was in 2011, during the last commodities boom. But the fun times came to an abrupt stop when commodities crashed in 2015. Around the same time, China launched the Belt and Road Initiative. So, when invitations were extended to Mongolia to sign into the Belt and Road, the Mongolian government needed little convincing. For an overview of the specific plans from the Mongolian viewpoint, I've come to the seat of government. Can you tell me how Mongolia plans to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative? Mongolia have uh, two neighbors. We could become uh, uh, one of the best uh, and the shortest and maybe most economical transit for uh, uh, 
between Europe and Asia, between Russia and China. And uh, one of the key components for that is uh, improvement of the railroad connections. Many infrastructure development projects are on the list of the projects to be implemented to increase the connectivity and uh, transit between our three countries. Under BRI, the number of China-Europe freight trains traveling through Mongolia increased by well over 50% in 2018. And Botbold is upbeat about future prospects. Do you think that the Belt and Road Initiative can turn Mongolia into an international logistics hub? Yes, this is a, one of the uh, most important uh, uh, target for Mongolia. And through our neighbors, we get uh, also better connectivity with the rest of the world. For instance, we are talking with uh, our both um, neighbors uh, on the transit trade agreement. And then we are talking on special agreement with certain ports, like in uh, Russia, we Vladivostok, mm -hmm. and in China, there is a seaport Tianjin. With those ports, it would provide a better access and connectivity. The Mongolian economy is highly dependent on mining exports. Mongolia has gold, copper, lithium, uranium, and coal in some of the biggest mines in the world. The Belt and Road Initiative is expected to have a huge impact on the mining sector. To see how, I'm leaving the capital city and embarking on an epic road trip across the Great Steppes. My destination is Tavan Talgoy, the world's largest coal mine. At first, the drive is pleasant with light snowfall. Not quite what I'm expecting in the spring months of May. Then the snow got heavier, and now I'm stuck in a snowstorm in the middle of the Gobi Desert. The visibility has dropped down to less than five meters now, and there are potholes all over the road. I'm really hoping we don't get a flat tire, because if we do, we could possibly be stuck out here in this snowstorm, and people have actually died being in that situation. So hopefully we'll reach our destination soon. With no GPS, no phone reception, no paved roads, and no visibility, we soldier on. 11 hours later, we finally find our way. Shelter at long last. That night, as I scramble for shelter, two people die in the snowstorm. The next day, it is a winter wonderland in the middle of the month of May. Wow, look at all this powder that has fallen overnight. It's actually a little difficult to try to walk through this. Here's what I've driven all this way for. Tavan Talgoy, the world's largest coal mine. Until recently, this area of southern Mongolia was one of the world's last great wilderness. A desert that is home to gazelle, wild horses, and herders living a traditional nomadic existence. Now, people refer to it as Mine Golia. Oh, and just look at all of that out there. It's all the area caused by the storm. Yeah. It's of the storm last night. Man, that was crazy weather we had yesterday. Yeah, it's an unexpected weather condition we had yesterday. It was a heavy snow and storm, and that's why the mining field stopped temporarily. Because uh, the road downstairs it gets slippery. It creates the danger to have an accident. The mammoth dump trucks here carry 240 tons of coal. That's 240, 100,000 kilograms of load per truck. We certainly won't want those trucks losing grip on slippery snow-covered slopes. 
So if it wasn't for the weather, uh, the operations would be running around the clock then, huh? Yeah, we operate 24 hours with two shifts. Wow. So in a year then, how many times does the site close down? It depends, but uh, approximately around 10 days we stop because of these weather conditions. It's, uh, it's not a full day but hours of delay. So as, as soon as we uh, fix all the roads and stuff, we right back on. The pace of work here is unceasing. And that's because this is Mongolia's biggest money earner. The coal here pays for schools, hospitals, roads, and contributes to 6.5% of GDP. The country earned 169.2 million U.S. dollars from coal exports to China in the month of January 2019 alone. Definitely the biggest trust I've ever seen. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Whoa. So these can carry a load of 240 tons? Exactly! Wow! Massive! It's like a house on wheels. Yeah! Huge! So they're heading over to the mine pit now? Yes. The history of this mine reflects the history of the country. It was started with the help of the Soviet Union. At one point, mining rights belonged to the Chinese. Now the mine is nationalized and has become a symbol of Mongolian national pride. <laughs> but it's one thing to own the mine. The ultimate buyer of all this coal is China. And if you're wondering what all of this has to do with you, consider this. Coking coal from here is sent to China. This coal is not used for power stations, but it is used to make steel. And steel is used to make cars, roads, railways, skyscrapers, and cities. It is exported all along the New Silk Road from China to Africa, to Indonesia, to Sri Lanka, and beyond. So if there's Chinese-built infrastructure in your neighborhood, it's possible that there's a trace of Mongolian coal in the supply chain. So you made all this for dinner? Yeah. I have to say, it looks very good. We've got beef, we've got stir-fried mixed vegetables, even kimchi. And this looks like some kind of dessert. We're out in the middle of nowhere. This is a hardship zone. So the company is keeping all these workers well-fed in order for them to stay happy. Is it tough working out here? Your work goes towards the national budget, you know, funding roads, building schools. How do you feel about that? I am going to go to the United States. I am going to go to the United States. China is the main buyer of your coal. Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> China needs coal, and Mongolia needs a buyer. This is the undisputed win-win partnership that China so often talks about in its rhetoric on the Silk Road. But how all that coal is transported to China is an issue of contention for Mongolians. And this is where the new Silk Road will have a major impact. I'm traveling on the China-Mongolia-Russia Economic Corridor. And it's a corridor of rail, roads, economic projects, and mines. The biggest mine of all is Tavan Tolgoi, believed to be the largest coal deposit in the world. 
The biggest mine also presents one of the largest logistical headaches in the world. Just how do you get all this coal to the factories in China? This extraordinary footage shows an equally extraordinary traffic jam, one that truck drivers from the mine heading to the China border have to endure every day. It's a journey that can stretch from two to 15 days. And before the drivers head into that road, they wait here for the coal to get loaded. Since they'll be waiting here a long time, I'm sure they won't mind some company. Ah. Sembenota. It's nice and cozy in here. Altan Suk Chulun Batar is a veteran trucker. He's used to the long waits. His truck is equipped with cooking facilities and stocked with meat. To live in such a confined space must be tough. And isn't it dangerous when you're out on the road? In the last three years, more than 50 lives were lost on this coal road, the result of tired drivers, bad weather, and poorly maintained roads. Better roads, and much more of them, are urgently needed in Mongolia. This is where China's Belt and Road Initiative could make a world of difference for the country. With the Belt and Road Initiative, there are plans to make a better road to connect to the mine. Are you looking forward to that? What's planned extends far beyond the asphalt. There will even be railways to connect the mine directly to China. This will be a key component of the China-Mongolia-Russia economic corridor plan. How do you think the Belt and Road Initiative will impact the operation of the mine? The Mongolians are saying that the there is much excitement amongst miners, economists, and business people over the BRI infrastructure projects. Better infrastructure means mining operations can expand with more revenue from coal. But one group of Mongolians are less enthusiastic. These are the nomads who have lived here for generations and whose vast pastures will now be crisscrossed with new roads and rail lines. They have voiced their unhappiness publicly and have allied with environmental groups. Today, I want to meet them to hear their concerns. But they're so hard to find. Man, trying to find the nomad family out here is difficult. The snow is white, their gur is white. It's like trying to spot the elusive snow leopard. <laughs> the vast Gobi Desert stretches out before me as I drive directionless in search of my interviewees. I can't imagine what it's like living out here in minus 50 degrees Celsius winters, with no electricity and no heating. Even before meeting them, I've gained newfound respect for the nomads and their legendary ruggedness. Ah, at last, here's a herd of goats. So that means there must be some people nearby. Maybe let's drive around the hill and see if there's anyone over there, yeah. Yeah, behind this ridge.
Dame nota. Oh, wow. That's a full bucket of milk, huh? Ah, in the Saksaha, was not always trusting my watches. Yama has to talk to her. So, how many goats do you have? A mother got a bar mutton of the Mertons or a mutter, but not always a daughter. Out in the steppes, animals are critical for survival. They provide food and water. Anything that harms the animals impact the nomads. And the effects of mining on animals are well documented. Okay. Ah, thank you. It must sadden you to see nature destroyed like that. In the house, not a hot row, no stick at the high. But a conduct in some other zone machine of John to tell what the invisible from your bargain. Take it on the intinuary on the contemporary of Jews. Mining turns pasture land from this to this. They suck up scarce water resources and create clouds of dust that cover nearby fields. Then there are the trucks, which drive all over the pasture lands in the absence of proper roads. It's no wonder that nomads and environmental groups are up in arms. With the new Silk Road, there are plans to build more roads and a railway right through here. What are your thoughts on that? The same thing which also would be a hot and we chase the Jalla you with him. The Tumor Zamazo, you Tavich or so, Hama was you the Bishir to you with him. And Toss Chilton Jalla was hot, the Bishir in Taram Toy. Yeah, well, let's hope that the grasslands here can be preserved. It's hard to imagine that the new Silk Road will be coming to a place as remote as the South Gobi. But construction on the railway is 70% complete and will soon reach the homes of these nomads. Chinese President Xi Jinping told world leaders at the second Belt and Road Conference in Beijing that environmental protection must underpin the Belt and Road Initiative. And here in the Gobi Desert, there is new hope that the BRI roads and railways will mitigate some of the environmental problems that mining has already caused. There are various environmental concerns around mining, of course. So how does Mongolia balance the difficult task of environmental protection and the need to grow your economy? <laughs> In the Altero, you're not directing on the other words, the circuits to your northern hands of work, but still not the Hundra. You're not Mongolian, all the Hal de Gundel in Chilet Sachel in the Gunner Shield and Horn named Jelly Hot San Gurcha. In Hoxan, the Nutra Stungan Dangal of the Nitin Sigman, who told her to hook Chilla Tanga of Chow, Chas, Bidner, Balanchta, Ekota Hanor, the head of the Bushat Taros or Taros or Shilch in all the Hansal Prig in Mongol Singh. What does the future hold for these nomads? They don't fit into a market economy. They're self-sufficient and constantly on the move. They don't spend money, so they don't need salaries. What will a Silk Road and its promise of investment and development mean for them? And what about other Mongolians who guard the nomadic way of life fiercely?
I'm traveling along China's New Silk Road, and I've arrived in the land of the eternal blue sky. Mongolia is part of a new three-nation economic corridor connecting China, Mongolia, and Russia. It's one of six corridors in the Belt and Road Initiative. And since Mongolia got plugged in, China has put money into plenty of projects here, including a new sports stadium, highways, mines, power plants, and more. Even then, some Mongolians haven't gotten over their old ill feelings about their neighbor. Worse still, Chinese people and projects have become targets of ultra-nationalist groups. Nationalism can take extreme forms in Mongolia. There are even some neo-Nazi groups here. One of them, called Sagan Kas, have talked about their admiration of Hitler. They've even gone as far as shaving the heads of Mongolian women who have Chinese boyfriends. Today, I'm going to meet one nationalist group who are less extreme. They express their patriotism through environmentalism. This is the office of Standing Blue Mongol. Well known for their attacks on Chinese-owned mines and protests against some Chinese-owned companies who they blame for environmental problems. What does your organization stand for? How many members do you have? What kind of problems have these Chinese-owned mines caused? What action has your group taken against these companies? do you feel any regret for your acts of violence in the past? Mongolia is a supporter of China's Belt and Road Initiative. What are your views on that? Standing Blue Mongol is unapologetically Sinophobic. And there are several other groups like them targeting the Chinese in Mongolia. Sinophobia is also not unique to Mongolia. In my work on China's New Silk Road, I've seen Sinophobic gangs in Central Asia. In Kyrgyzstan, Kirk Chiro targeted Chinese men and raided night spots which they visited. Similar gangs have also emerged in Piraeus in Greece, targeting the Chinese who have bought over the national port. The guy I just interviewed is a huge wrestler. I felt like a little boy next to him. And I have to say, I do feel sorry for all the people he's roughed up. Would you say that these ultra-nationalist groups, do they have a significant following? Uh, are the public sympathetic towards them, or do they view them in as outlaws? Case by case, in some cases, the people were not following our standards. There were cases, the environmental mm -hmm. regulations was very tough, violated by a Chinese-owned company. Mm -hmm. And however, it should be the state who is demanding order, not the some group who is demanding order and they to follow it. It's illegal. Uh, I had the chance to meet with the group Standing Blue Mongol. And uh, as we know, ultra-nationalist groups are on the rise. It seems global. Were they friendly to you? Oh, yeah, they were super yeah, friendly. That 
basically answers the question, yeah. right? Mongolians are disarmed with charm. That's what yes, they're doing. They look like big guys with tattoos and you know silver keychains and teddy bear hearts. And, uh, but when they are on media or when you engage them, they are like the ordinary Mongolians. We are a young democracy, and hate crimes are, I think, are low. Um, there are records of hate crimes towards some Chinese construction workers. We have seen them on social media and there's police reports of it, but it's not uh, to a level that it becomes a really serious problem. So in general, would you say that the Mongolian public is sympathetic towards the causes of these ultranationalist groups, or would they kind of view them as uh, uh, outlaws or just Rebel there's, rousers. there's two very different camps. I think um, a good number of the public supports um, environmental activists or uh, nationalist groups, uh, but there are also Western educated Mongolians who are metropolitan, who sees them as uh, very barbaric. Are these groups all xenophobic though? I think they are generally xenophobic because when we ask um, social polls when we ask who do you see as a friend, which nation do you see as uh, Mongolia's friend, then Russians have about 70 to 80 percent approval rate and this is the Soviet legacy, technology transfer and um, the anti-Chinese sentiment still runs strong. There are two sides to China's Silk Road in Mongolia. On the one hand, there are expectations that it will create jobs and lift economic growth. On the other hand, there are fears that it might damage the environment and exploit Mongolia. Whatever the view is, one thing's clear. Mongolia is a fully functioning democracy with press freedom. And people are encouraged to express their opinions. Social issues are not just debated on TV and social media. They are also expressed in pop culture. In our show, we don't just talk about politics, but we really try to capture the soul of a country. And what better way to do that than through music? This is Mongolia's biggest band at the moment. They're called The Who, and their music feels like a war cry. The Who's videos have been viewed more than 19 million times on YouTube, and they have been booked to perform at festivals in Europe and USA. Fusing Mongolian traditional instruments and throat singing with modern rock, their music is strangely hypnotic. I'm meeting the band today to unravel the distinctive lyrics. We are the Who. You guys are known as the Who band. Uh, what does Who mean? Who does Who mean? Who does Who get H-U, I had you name it Chimal Monster, who put you out on sang so shit. Can you tell me about some of the unique instruments you use? Marunghor Tashur or Unist Nitu Turkchum. The Marunghor Uchmigos, I'll get the shit. Green Jaw at the Irin Himmel Sergit Green Jaw at Nagas, you took the team from Slitim Bill Shift, which you took the Gokchimaga, Tashur Uchimal Dotain. Not a toy, not a drum, think the last book. 
тэр эртнээс одоо тэр ул бол энэ төр төөхтэйгээ холбогдоход одоо одоо амин сонсуулж одоо унаан улдаг тийм хөгжим байгаа Your music sounds quite nationalistic. What are you trying to convey in that song The Wolf Totem? А чон сүлдөө бол хүн бүрт одоо альва нэг зовлон бэрхшээл тохиолдсон үед тэрийг даван туулах тэр эрч хүчийг өхөд одоо зориулагдсан тийм сэтгэлтэй байна уу? Аа хитэ үг нь энэ дайн тулааны талаар өгүүлж байгаа ч гэсэн энэ бол өнөөгийн одоо бидний нийгэмт салшгүй холбоотой зарим хүмүүс хүн төвчнтэй тэмцэж байна. Зарим хүмүүс шудар бус байдалтай тэмцэж байна. Зарим бүх нийтээр одоо дэлхийн талааралтай тэмцэж байна. Энэ бүгдийг даван туулахад одоо хүний дотор байдаг тэр баатарлаг, сүнслэг, тэр эрч хүчийг бадраахыг бид нар хүсэж энд үг бүтээсэн. What are your hopes for your country? Тэгээд их орныгаа ямар байгаасаа гэж өөртөө гэвэл одоо хүн өр нүлдэг арваа өр хөөхтэй одоо хойч ирээдүгээ бид амар амглан тайван сайхан дэлхийн боловсрал боловсралыг Монголтой сурч эзмэштэй таатай нөхцөлөө байдал өссөн одоо энэ онгон дагшин байдлаа алдахгүй бол их орны минь хөгжөөс л гэж боддог та. My time in Mongolia is coming to an end, and I have come to respect the rugged people here and their long and proud history. Change is coming with China Silk Road, and the government here is mindful about the need of a sustainable Silk Road. A Silk Road that will respect nature and conserve Mongolia's resources for generations to come. Thank you.